One of my all-time favorite descriptions of Jesus is found in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, which reads, He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. The word of His power. Just look at those three magnificent phrases. He's the radiance of the glory of God. You know, when you close your eyes and you feel the warmth of the sun radiating out and falling upon your face, Jesus is the, the glory of God that has come up close and personal. It touches us. Jesus Himself put it this way, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, John 14, verse 9. For as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, we behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He is the exact imprint of His nature. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. Colossians 1.15 says he is, he is the image of the invisible God. The image of the invisible God. As the Nicene Creed in 325 AD puts it, He is very God of very God. And the writer to Hebrews says, He upholds the universe by the word of His power. The word of His power. For as John 1 verses 1 to 3 says concerning Jesus, in the beginning was the word, the logos. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that has been made. When God speaks and brings all of creation into existence, that Word is Jesus. And through Him all things were created. And by him all things are sustained. As Colossians 1.17 says, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, because he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And that word became flesh and made its dwelling amongst us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, who is full of grace and truth, John 1.14. Why am I sharing all of this? <laughs> because when Jesus, the word through whom everything was created and by whom all things are sustained by the power of His Word. When Jesus, the incarnate Word of God Himself, speaks, all of creation sits up and takes notice. When Jesus speaks, stuff happens. When Jesus speaks, stuff happens. Give me an example, Pastor Philip. Grab your Bibles. Luke chapter 4. Verses 31 down to 44, our passage today, Luke 4, 31 to 44, you'll find today's reading on page 860 in the Pew Bible, 860 if you want to grab that. Let me read these verses to us this morning, Luke 4, 31. And he, Jesus, went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath, and they were astonished at his teaching. For his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, what is this word? What is this word? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. 
And he arose and he left the synagogue and he entered Simon's house. And now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. <laughs> now when the sun was setting, all who had been, uh, all, all those who had Uh, any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many crying, you are the son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went to a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and They would have kept him from leaving them, but he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Thanks be to the Lord for the reading of his word. So in this passage, we find Jesus, the incarnate word of God, wielding the power of of his word with astonishing authority as he's dispatching demons and mending maladies. There's your outline for this morning. Astonishing authority, dispatching demons, and mending maladies. Would you bow your heads and pray with me as we dig in? Father, help us to see Jesus in all of his power, his authority, the wonder of his word, his incarnation that sends everything reeling. Father, help us to receive this, to understand who Jesus is and what he means for us. We pray this in his matchless name. Amen. Amen. So first of all, astonishing authority. Astonishing authority. I love how this begins, chapter 4, 31. He went down to Capernaum, the city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath, and they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed, what's the word? Authority, authority. So here we are, once again, Jesus is teaching on the Sabbath. He has faced rejection up in Nazareth, his hometown, and now he has come 40 miles down the road to Capernaum, which is nestled on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And Dr. Luke tells us here, they were astonished at his teaching for his word possessed authority. And when Jesus taught, it often elicited responses like this. For example, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew gives us this summary statement. The crowds were astonished, same word, at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as their scribes, not as their scribes. What gave Jesus teaching such authority? Hmm? What gave Jesus such a th- teaching such authority? Let me suggest to you that, that there were three key ingredients to his authority. His approach, his content, and his person. His approach, his content, and his person. First, his approach. The scribes and the teachers of the law in Jesus' day were well-researched. They were highly educated, and they would often, in their homilies, their sermons, their messages, they would often... Uh, quote at length uh, from centuries of rabbinic tradition. So this guy says this, this other guy says this, put it together, maybe we get this, that sort of thing. So they would go through a passage and they would tell you what everybody else, all the experts, all the authorities would have said about that passage. They had amazing citations and they had a real depth to their footnotes, right? But when Jesus talked, taught, it sounded a little bit more like this. You've heard it said, but I say to you. That's a remarkable difference. You have heard it said, but I say to you. He didn't cite the authorities. He challenged the authorities. He spoke on his own authority, his own authority. It's a very different approach. Secondly, his content. 
Luke doesn't actually tell us the content of Jesus' teaching right here in these verses, but we can infer it. If we skip to the end of the passage, down in verse 42, this is what Luke writes. And when it was day, he departed, he went to a desolate place, and the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, here's the key part, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And he went on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. So there's the content, you see it. He is preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. The other towns need the same message that he has given to them. The kingdom of God is at hand, Jesus says. His rule and reign is breaking into the world. Even now, he is beginning to set things to rights in the person of Jesus Christ. And if you will repent, if you will turn away from your way of life, and you will come and apprentice yourself to me, to follow me, Jesus says, I will lead you into the abundant life of the kingdom of God. It wasn't so much good advice on how you and I can make our way to God as it was good news of what God has done to make his way to us. Everybody else was dishing out good advice. Jesus was announcing good news, you see. He spoke with authority. The third thing is that this authority is in his person, his person. Since Jesus is the incarnate word, of God. When he speaks, it's more than just words. You see that? He is the word. He is the embodiment of the truth. The man is the message. He is the word of life come to dwell amongst us. And so when he quotes scriptures, I love this, he quotes them as referring to himself. We saw this back in verses 18 and 19 last time. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is all coming true in me. Who says that? Who is that audacious? Who could speak with that kind of astonishing authority? Jesus, that's who. That's who. His authority is in his person. You see that? And here's the point, friends. At the king's word, souls stir. At the king's word, souls stir. Jesus is preaching the good news of the kingdom of God, and he has come himself as the king. And when the king issues a proclamation, the people listen. When the creator calls, creation responds. When the one who upholds the universe with the word of his power utters teaching, the cosmos leans in to listen. And when the, in, in the, when the incarnate Word of God opens up the inspired Word of God, souls stir and come to life. Isn't this beautiful? We're watching Jesus wield the Word of His power with astonishing authority. That's where this begins, astonishing authority. Secondly, we see Him dispatching demons, dispatching demons. Verse 33, and in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, ha, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. What a moment, what a moment. Most of the people in the synagogue here in Capernaum had no idea this demon was in their midst. But as Jesus speaks with power and authority, it flushes this evil spirit out into the open. He's under pressure. He can't handle it. And he bursts out and he yells, ha, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Translation, stop it. Leave us alone. What are you doing here? This is our domain. It's a challenge, isn't it, to Jesus' authority. The demon wants Jesus to be quiet and get out of town. That's what he's doing. 
He hisses, the demon does, have you come to destroy us? This is actually a response we see many places in the scriptures. The demons know their time is limited. They know that one day Satan and his, and his minions will be bound and cast in the lake of fire forever when Jesus makes all things new. And this poor, bewildered demon thinks this is the end. That might be today where he meets his end. And so he goes on the attack. He decides to go down swinging. And he says, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. It's, it's interesting. Jesus is always silencing demons. He doesn't want them. They know who he is. And he says, be quiet. Be quiet. Why, why would he do that? Throughout the Gospels, we find Jesus constantly telling people to keep his identity quiet. It, it's, it's like he's trying to slow things down and keep it contained. Because if stuff starts moving too big, too fast, too early, he won't get all the things done he needs to get done before the cross comes and puts a terminus to, to the end of his earthly ministry. And I think what's happening here is the demon is trying to blow Jesus' cover. He's trying to get everything flying and blow everything up so that the crowds will crucify Jesus immediately. He won't have to deal with him. But Jesus, verse 35, rebuked him saying, be silent, come out of him. <laughs> I love it. The demon wanted Jesus to be quiet and leave. And now Jesus says, you be quiet and leave, right? And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him and having done him no harm. So not only does Jesus' word have astonishing authority, his word is also now dispatching demons, you see. At the word of Jesus, this evil spirit throws this poor man into the ground in some sort of convulsion and then flees the scene in terror. Verse 36, they were all amazed and said to one another, what is this word? With authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. And reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. <laughs> I don't you just love this question, what is this word, this logos. With authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. And just, just so we don't think this is a one-off situation, skip down to verse 41. Luke tells us, on the demons also came out of many, crying, you are the son of God. And he rebuked them, would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Christ. Here's the point, friends. When the king speaks, darkness trembles. When the king speaks, darkness trembles. Jesus is Lord of the supernatural. Jesus has authority over the demonic realm. Jesus is king over all the spiritual powers. Now, a little aside here. We here in the West tend to struggle with passages like this because in general we're skeptical of the supernatural. We think demons, spirits, supernatural evil beings, really? I mean, how, like, how primitive is that, right? In Western culture, we've largely tried to demystify evil. So we talk about evil, but we change the labels. We talk about psychological maladjustment. We talk about trauma responses. We talk about social conditioning. We talk about unjust systems. We talk about power struggles. And we think that these human factors can fully account for all the horrors and atrocities of this broken world. But those explanations, friends, are frankly falling short. They're wearing thin. I mean, how many mass shootings will it take? How many suicide bombings must we endure? How much sex trafficking must we face? How much evil must we encounter before we realize that what the Bible has been telling us all along is the truth? That evil arises from three sources, from the world, the flesh, and the devil. Evil is embedded in the cultures and systems of this world. Evil arises from within us, from our own selfish flesh and will, and evil preys upon us as the devil and his minions seek to kill, steal, and destroy what God loves most, his children. 
Can't, can't you perceive the diabolical, sinister, evil forces behind rampant suicide, serial abuse, terrorism, abortion, sex trafficking, pornography, gambling, genocide? Can't you see it? We're under attack, friends. And in the West, our categories are just simply not adequate. And the sooner we wise up, the better. Laman Sane is a, um, prof- he was a professor at Yale. He died back in uh, 2019. Um, he's from Gambia, which is in West Africa. And he wrote a book in 2003 called Who's Chris- Whose Religion is Christianity? Whose Religion is Christianity? And he writes of the frustration that black Africans felt when they came to Ivy League schools like Yale. Everyone, he says, everyone says they love our culture. You know, we love your Africanness. We love your, your food, your clothing, your accent. It's beautiful. He says, but what they loved was the most superficial things about us. When it came to the heart of what it meant to be African, to believe, which is to believe in the spirit realm, the sacred, the struggle between good and evil, they would tell us to become enlightened to be more scientific, more technologically aware, more naturalistic in our worldview. And Sane says, listen, the Ivy League culture embraced the most superficial things about us while gutting the very heart of what made us African. He said, but you know what? Christianity didn't do that. He said, the reason so many African people have embraced Jesus is because of his power over the supernatural as demonstrated in the triumph of his cross and resurrection. He writes this, quote, Africans sense in their hearts that Jesus did not mock their respect for the sacred or their clamor for an invincible savior. So they beat their sacred drums for him until the stars skipped and danced in the skies. And after that dance, the stars weren't little anymore. Christianity helped Africans become renewed Africans, not remade Europeans. Now, here's the point. Here's the point. Here's the point. We in the West can learn a lot from the global South. And one of those things is to allow passages like this to show us the wonder and beauty to open our eyes to the majesty of Jesus. Jesus is the all-powerful Son of God. He is Lord over all the powers in the universe. He's the defeater of the diabolical. Before him, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And at the king's word, the darkness trembles. It's the word of his power, friends, dispatching demons. So you have astonishing authority, the dispatching of demons, and now finally the mending of maladies, the mending of maladies. Verse 38, he arose, he left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. (laughs) So this is Simon's house. This is uh, like Simon Peter's house. And he's one of the most well-known of Jesus' disciples. We, we don't know that yet in Luke's telling of the story, but he will be. And he is married. He has a mother-in-law. He's at that house with her, and uh, she's ill. Uh, she has a high-grade fever. Um, scholars will tell, tell you, if you read the commentaries, that this is actually a technical medical term that Dr. Luke, the physician, uses here. Uh, he's just, you know, he's very precise, and he can't help himself. And so he writes, he's writing medical terminology right here into the text. And they appeal to him on her behalf, and, uh, and they say, listen, well, Jesus, if you could send the demons fleeing, you know, could you do anything about this fever? Hmm? Could you maybe help us out here? In verse 39, he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. It's fascinating. He rebuked the fever. Same word that he used up in verse 35 
when he rebukes the demon. Now he rebukes the fever, and at his word, the fever flees. And she's so grateful to feel so much better, she hops up and makes some dinner. (laughs) Everybody wins here. She's better, Jesus gets a meal, and Peter gets some valuable points with his (laughs) mother-in-law. Because you always need points with your mother-in-law, right? Preach it, say amen, somebody, there we go. You know what I'm talking about. And again, just so we don't mistake this as a one-off, verse 40, Luke tells us, now when the sun was setting and all who... Uh, had, uh, who had any who were sick and various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. I love this image. Jesus laying his hands on the sick and the disease. You know, when people are sick, we don't want to touch them. We're really careful, right? We're washing our hands. We're doing the sanitizer thing. Like, why? Because we're worried about contagion. We don't want their sickness to rub off on us. But Jesus isn't worried about contagion. And actually, he wants contagion. He wants his health to rub off on them. So he touches them with his bare hands, and he heals all of them. It reminds me of Genesis chapter 2, where God has his hands in the dirt, molding Adam's body with earthly soil, creating bodily form and life. And now we have Jesus, the Son of God incarnate, laying his hands on the diseased and deformed bodies that have been so ravaged by the fall, and he is even now refashioning and reforming and renewing these bodies. You see, in creation and in recreation, God opts for a hands-on approach. You see that? He'll let, he'll let his hands get dirty if it means giving you life. He'll let his hands touch illness if it means, means bringing you healing. He'll let his hands get pierced if it means saving your soul. See, all these miraculous healings, friends, in all of them, it's a glimpse. It's a glimpse, isn't it? It's a picture of the eschaton, of the last days when the world will be set to rights and Jesus will be enthroned forever as King of kings and Lord and lords over a new heavens and a new earth. It's a picture of what is coming As Revelation 21, 3 to 5 says, Behold, the dwelling place of God will be with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. How do you wipe tears? With your hand. He's hands on again, you see. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Behold, I am making all things new. So you see what's happening, friends, in these healings that Jesus is doing in Capernaum. He's wielding the power of the eschaton. He's taking a tiny droplet of all that eschatological glory when everything is made right and new in the new creation. He's taking a droplet of it and he's bringing it back in time. And he's taking that little dropper and he's just dropping it down. Look what I can do. Look what it will one day be like. He is doing for one person in Capernaum what he will one day do for all people in the dawn of the new creation. It's a glimpse of the world to come. A little crack has opened in the walls of the world and the light of the new creation is shining in. As he rebukes these fevers, as he heals these diseases, at the king's word, friends, renewal begins. Renewal 
begins. The eschaton is dawning. The kingdom is breaking in. The renewal of all things has begun. And with the word of his power, Jesus is making it so. He's making it so. What, what is this word, this logos, that preaches the kingdom with authority, that silences demons and they go running, that rebukes fevers and heals the sick? This is Jesus, the word made flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, the incarnate king who will defeat death by becoming, uh, will def- I'm sorry, let me say that again, who will defeat sin by becoming sin for us, who will crush Satan by receiving the serpent's bite, and who will vanquish death by allowing death to swallow him up. Don't you see, friends, as Jesus here is sharing the spoils of his victory over sin, Satan, and death with these folks in Capernaum. He is spending capital he has not yet earned. He is committing himself to the cross. When did Jesus conquer sin, Satan, and death? On the cross and through his resurrection, which has not happened yet. He wields the power of the new creation which can only come through his death and resurrection. And in doing so, by exercising this authority, he guarantees he will go to the cross. He is wielding the power of the eschaton at his own expense. At his own expense. Their freedom will require his bondage. Their healing will require his wounding. Their life will require his death. You see, he's already becoming their substitute. They just don't even know it yet. Isn't this beautiful? In this passage, we see Jesus' fierce loyalty for his people. We see his willingness to get his hands dirty for us. We see his willingness to fight against the tyranny of sin, Satan, and death. We see his willingness to wield authority on behalf of those he loves, even at great personal cost to himself. And it's a reminder to us, to those of us who are united to Christ by grace through faith in him, who have put all our hopes on Jesus Christ who died for us and rose again, Here's the hope. If God is for us, who can stand against us? If God is for us, who can stand against us? Jesus is the all-powerful Word of God, friends. He's the master of all creation. He is Lord over all the powers. He's the defeater of the diabolical. He's the dispenser of the diseases. He has triumphed over sin and Satan and death. And in him, all things will be made new and whole and right and beautiful forever. And all shall be well. So as Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen? Don't you see the logic of that verse, those verses? He's Paul saying, look, no matter what kind of awful stuff you face in life, if God is for you, If Jesus is with you, it's going to be okay. More than okay. 
In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Friends, because you realize Jesus has already defeated the worst enemies you and I could ever face. Sin that could have separated us from God forever. Jesus paid it in full. Satan who could have tormented us for eternity. Jesus rescued us from his fangs. Death that could have buried us forever. Jesus has turned our graves into gardens. Oh, you see what this means? It means in Jesus, you're invincible. You're invincible. You've already won. You're more than conquerors through him who loves you. Which means, listen, listen. It means you can face cancer. And know that while it may take your body down, it can never touch your soul. Because your life is hidden in Christ forever. Incorruptible. It means you can face persecution. And losing your job and having friends turn their back on you and banning you on their social media because you know you can never lose what is eternally yours in Jesus Christ. It means you can face death, the greatest enemy of all, knowing that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. <laughs> Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, grave, is your sting? For the one who upholds the whole universe with the word of his power, who speaks with authority, who rebukes the demons and they flee, who confronts sickness and it's healed, that same Jesus, the incarnate word, has given you his word, his promise that he will never leave you. And he will never forsake you. And he will be with you to the very end of the age. Yeah. And friends, if God is for you, who can be against you? Who can be against you? Let's pray. Oh, Father, we rejoice and celebrate the victory of the invincible Christ who goes toe-to-toe -to -toe against the greatest enemies and prevails, and who does so at great personal cost to himself. Our salvation required his sacrifice, but in his love he has bought us and made us his own, secure as children of God for all time and eternity. We are on the victory side because of him. And so we give him all of our praise, all of our singing, all of our adoration. We beat our drums if we have them for him because he is Lord of all. And it's in his matchless name we pray, amen.